Romans 8. We'll cover three verses or so tonight as we proceed the next month or two over Romans 8 before we take our break and study Hosea before Romans chapter 9. There's a natural break in the book of Romans between Romans 8 and 9 as he starts talking about the promises given to Israel in Romans 9 and what happened to them. But uh, tonight we're in Romans 8 verse 9 where Paul's been talking about walking after the Spirit. The chapter started out like that. Uh, those who walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we've been dealing with what that is. Last week, we tried to discern the difference between flesh and spirit, as Paul was describing the, those of the carnal mind and the spiritual mind and what that meant. And we tried to define that, as we will again throughout the, the chapter, that the spiritual mind is not some esoteric, mystical, I'm going to meditate. Uh, you know, that's not spiritual. Spiritual has to do with uh, the truth that God has revealed through his spirit for you to know about him, about spiritual things. Amen. And so if you do not know the thing that is spiritual, you simply do not have the spiritual insight. Uh, it is not something that you feel or some intuition. It is actual communication from the only being that can understand spiritual things truly, which is God. God is spirit. And he has revealed to us in his word uh, what, who he is and what he's doing and he's described for us our inner man, which science can't tell how that works. And so we can learn uh, from his revelation about spiritual things. And so spiritual mindedness has to do with you having in mind the things that God has spoken and instructed specifically about you in this dispensation of grace. So that's what that means. Uh, rather the carnal mind then, which is something we all are born with and also still operate with from time to time because we're living in, in our flesh and in this world, the carnal mind is defined as that mind you had when you were ignorant and absent of the knowledge that you had about Christ now through your salvation. And so when Paul says there's a carnal mind and a spiritual mind, uh, you who are now in Christ have a spiritual mind because you have received, at the very least, the gospel of your salvation and, and what Christ has done for you. That information about your sin and him being the Savior that changes the input in your thinking and thus your direction, literally as it uh, pertains to your eternal destination, but also every day as you walk. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's an enemy of God. It cannot be subject to the law of God uh, because it does not understand, does not receive, does not know by faith the things God has said about what is right and what is, what is true. So that's what that means. So the carnal mind describes the, the operation of the natural man without, without God, without Christ. Uh, you who are saved... We are saved and understand some spiritual things, are constantly learning and growing in those spiritual things as we study the scripture. But we also have a choice of whether to walk according to what we know, these spiritual things, by faith, or I'm going to walk as if I don't know them, or that they're not true, which is how any unsaved person would operate, ignorant of the truth that God has revealed. So that's the distinction between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind in Romans 8, verse 6, 7, and 8. He says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, but he says in verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh. Good news, that verse. Uh, you're not in the flesh. Well, how does he know? Well, if you're saved, you're not in the flesh. Even though you know you have your mortal flesh and your body here, he says your position is not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so Paul is saying, if you are saved, if you are a Christian, if you're in the body of Christ, if you're a believer, uh, you have the spirit of Christ. And if you have the spirit of Christ, you're Christ's. Uh, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not. That's just the bottom line. And so if you don't know who the spirit is and what he's doing, that's one thing. But to say, I don't have the spirit, I'm rejecting spiritual truth, you're not Christ. You can't be. Um, so this, this is contrary to the idea that you can be Christ's without the knowledge of it, without the understanding of the gospel, without having the Spirit of God. You simply cannot be. And so there are lost people as we all once were. So you receive the Holy Spirit upon belief of the gospel. The Bible tells us this in Ephesians chapter 113, one place it tells us that, where upon hearing the gospel of your salvation, Ephesians 1 says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It says, in Christ you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that, after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You hear the gospel of your salvation, you believe, you trust the gospel of your salvation, trust in Christ, and then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is what happens 
upon your belief in salvation. Now, that doesn't mean suddenly you feel warm and fuzzy, as John Wesley described in some of his uh, uh, journaling of his experience. It doesn't require that, because the Holy Spirit doesn't move with warm and fuzzies or cold chills, and he just indwells you, right? And you only know that by faith in what the Bible said, right? And so this is what's going on here in Ephesians 1.13. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know you not of the Corinthians, which apparently some people may not know. Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? You're the temple of God, and the Holy Ghost dwells in you? That's what 1 Corinthians 3.16 says. And so in Romans 8, verse 9, when he says, You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Dwell means he lives in you, he abides in you. Uh, now, if we may have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Notice, as we read through this passage, how many times the Spirit is mentioned. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, right? If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. There's number two, Spirit of God. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, that's number three. Three mentions in the verse of the word Spirit, and that's capital S Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit that he's talking about here that you have. And this Holy Spirit of God is different and distinct from your own. Maybe I'll draw, as I drew last week, the picture of a person, a man, <clears throat> saved, made of body, put flesh next to that, and then in their inner man, the body is what you see, is the outside, and the inner man it consists of soul and spirit, that soul uh, being the part of you that identifies who you are, uh, that soul being the person that you are, uh, you can replace a body part, as mo modern science do, does these things, you get a heart transplant or something, but you are still you, Amen. even though your body has changed. Uh, thank God for that, by the way, because our bodies will change eventually, completely. So the soul is who you are. The spirit is the thing that God has put in humanity here to allow us to know things, specifically the things of God. And so we are spiritual beings, is what we are, with physical bodies, because God is spirit, and he gave us a spirit to understand the things of God. So when you're lost and unsaved, the spirit the Bible calls is dead. It has no knowledge. It's darkened. It's void of information and, and belief in what God said. But when you're saved, the spirit here is quickened. It's made alive. And in addition to your spirit being turned on, Proverbs talks about the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. And so when it, when it gets turned on by belief in the gospel, you get saved, it's alive. Something else also happens, the Bible describes, which is that the Holy Spirit, and this is the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost also comes in to dwell with you and in you, in your body. Okay, and that's something different. The Holy Spirit is not your spirit, you understand? This is God, this is you. And yet it's hard to, how do you discern the difference? I mean, this, the Holy Spirit doesn't, you don't see him walk over like a ghost or something. So how do you know the difference between that? How do you know the difference between soul and spirit even? That's even difficult. There's an inner man and outer man the Bible talks about. Hebrews says only the word of God can discern the soul and the spirit and, and separate those and, and dissect those. So we can, we can learn from the Bible about that. Going back to Romans 8 verse 9, we're talking about the Holy Spirit here. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Your position is now not in who you were born as in Adam, but now who you are born as in the Holy Spirit, Amen. right? How he's regenerated you. And so the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, he says the spirit of Christ at the end of this verse, and, and I wanted to point out here that, that phrase spirit of Christ. Some people have questions about that. This is talking about the Holy Spirit given to you, okay? It's the Holy Spirit given by faith in Jesus Christ, and so it's Christ. Uh, but notice the two terms here in this verse. It's very interesting to see that the Spirit of God, let me draw this up here, the Spirit of God. And then you have the second term, the Spirit of Christ. Right? And it's talking about the same thing. He says, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. He's talking about the same subject. Same thing. But what's that mean? If these are the same thing, then that means they're the same thing. Amen. Right? Christ is God. That's what he's saying there. And so in this verse, you have the first mention is just spirit. You're in, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And then there's the spirit of God. There's the spirit of Christ. You have three in this verse. And all three are one. That's what's going on. You have Christ mentioned. You have the spirit of God. And you have just the spirit by himself. There's the Holy Spirit the Son and the Father, Father, Son, and Spirit. There's three there that are one. 
Interesting place to find that. He's not teaching the Trinity outright, but over and over again in Paul's epistles and in the scripture, you see these, these places where all three show up. The Bible teaches there's one God, there are three that are called God, and these three are one, as 1 John 5, 7 says. Look at Colossians 1, 27. <clears throat> Something else to see from Romans 8, verse 9, is this idea of the Spirit of Christ that we all have if we are saved or else we're not Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us. And to, to call it the Spirit of Christ is a unique thing. You see the, the term Holy Spirit many times and Holy Ghost many times, but the Spirit of Christ only shows up twice in your Bible. And this is one of them in Romans 8. We have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us. Colossians 1.27. We talk a lot about the mystery here. And uh, there's an idea that Paul first talks about the mystery in Ephesians and Colossians and doesn't talk about it prior to that. And I want to show how that's not true based on what we're studying in Romans 8, verse 9 here. Colossians 1, verse 27, or 26 says that God made Paul a minister uh, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, verse 26, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is the mystery? Which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Amen. So the definition here of the mystery, even another one in Ephesians 3, which is you in Christ, Colossians 1 talks about Christ in you, is the mystery of Christ. This is the mystery given to Paul, revealed to him, that was not known before, kept secret and hidden from ages and generations. And people read Colossians, they read Ephesians. Ephesians talks a lot about this mystery. And they say, well, there it is. Here's the pinnacle of Christian identity, is being members of the body of Christ. And Ephesians, this great mystery that God's now revealed. And they think that Romans doesn't include this at all. We've been seeing for the last three chapters, it does, over and over again. He doesn't use the word mystery, but he's teaching what it is, which is Christ in you. And Romans 8 verse 9 is a good example of that, because he says, if you do not have the spirit of Christ dwelling in you, you are not Christ's. What's that mean? The spirit of Christ is dwelling in you. People ask, well, how is it when Paul says Christ is in you? How, how does that work? Because Jesus Christ was incarnate. He put on human flesh. He died. He ascended to heaven. He's the head of the body, and he's up there. Like Paul even says that, Christ is in heaven. He set our affections up on things above. He's up there. So how is it that he's up there and he can dwell in me? Answer, he gave a spirit. Yeah. He gave the Holy Spirit. He gave the Holy Ghost. And he calls it here in Romans 8 verse 9, the spirit of Christ, because he gave it. And thus it identifies you with him and him with you. Christ is in you by the Holy Spirit. You understand that's what's going on there, because the three are one, folks. When Christ walked the earth and he spoke, he spoke from time to time as the I am. Well, who's that? That's God, right? Well, in the Old Testament, like Jehovah God. Is that God the Father? No, he's, he's the Son, but he's speaking as God. It's the same thing with the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. But the Spirit's not lesser God than Jesus, than, the, than Christ or the Father. It's God. So Christ dwells in you that way. It's according to what Paul says in Ephesians 3, 9, as the fellowship of the mystery. Okay, the fellowship you have with Christ, according to this mystery, where that you can be in Christ and Christ can be in you without Israel, without covenants, without the law, and without your works. And that's what Romans been, has been teaching, Romans 5 through 8. It's not your works, it's not the law, you're not Israel, but you are Christ by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you. So then we can see and make the conclusion that the mystery is Christ in you, according to Colossians 1.27, the hope of glory. It's Christ in you, which is the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you according to this fellowship. That's what that is. That's how Christ dwells in you. Amen. How does Christ know what's going on? Well, he's God, but the Holy Spirit is working in you. How does Christ work in you? Well, by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. That's how Christ works in you. Remember when Jesus left, before he left earth, and of course this was before the revelation of the mystery, but he said to the, the 12 apostles of Israel, I'll send my Holy Spirit to you, and he will speak of me, and he'll testify of me. You see, the Holy Spirit's job is not to speak of himself, but of Christ. Yeah. He is the, doing the work of God, and thus the work that Christ performed in you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. That's why when, when you say, I'm crucified with Christ, well, how is that? Because you're in Christ. Well, how did you get in Christ? The Holy Spirit put you there, right? Well, I'm, I'm resurrected with Christ. Well, how did you get resurrected with Christ? Well, because the power of resurrection. How did you get that power? The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You see, it's the Holy Spirit of Christ dwelling in you that makes this mystery true. Right? Without the Holy Spirit, you don't have this mystery. 
which is why the mystery could not have been revealed until the Holy Spirit was given, and then the mystery could be revealed about you being in Christ and Christ in you. I wanted to point this out, that Paul is describing what this mystery is, even though he doesn't use the word mystery. There's a reason why he uses the word mystery in Ephesians and Colossians. That's because he's contrasting it with something that was not. But in Romans 8, he's just laying out how you walk. You walk after the Spirit now, the Spirit of Christ. In fact, all of Romans 8 is dealing with this subject, the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what Colossians 1.27 said? The hope of glory? Well, if you know, if you've read ahead in Romans 8, you know Romans 8 is talking about the glory that will come to you because the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. That's what Romans 8 is teaching. He's teaching and elaborating even more than Colossians 1, the mystery. That's what's going on. Just one more point to bring this home, and then I'll, we'll move on to Romans 8, verse 10. I have here a, a commentary by William Newell. Some of you may know him, some may not. He is the, the author of the song At Calvary. We changed the title to By Calvary, uh, if you've sung that hymn. Uh, he's also, uh, he's, he's long dead now, but uh, he was an Acts 2 dispensationalist. He was not mid-Acts dispensational. Okay, he was an Acts 2 dispensationalist. In his commentary on Romans, which is pretty decent, he says about Romans 8, verse 10 here, he says, Romans 8, 10, the spirit of Christ dwelling in you. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory, according to Colossians 1, 27. And it's called by the apostle there, the riches of the glory of this mystery, the great revelation which Paul's gospel contains. Now, this is Acts 2 dispensationalist, mind you, an older traditional dispensationalist. They were a lot more Pauline back then. You see, there wasn't really a mid-Acts position. It was dispensational. Then suddenly there was the Acts 28 position. And so he makes these comments to defend against the idea the Acts 28 posi- that holds that was, the mystery isn't found in Romans. It's found in Ephesians and Colossians. He goes, no, 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 no. It's over here in Romans as well. Yeah. He says it's a terrible error to confine the revelation of that mystery to what are called the prison epistles, beginning with Ephesians. The two sides of the gospel, we in Christ and Christ in us, are constantly set forth from Romans on. The very words of our verse in verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, that's a wonderful find, is what he says. In Galatians also, Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. He goes on to quote 2 Corinthians and Galatians and another verse in 2 Corinthians, talking about us being in Christ and Christ in us, before Ephesians. Okay, He says, let us beware of the false teaching that only the so-called prison epistles are church truth. For in all Paul's epistles, we find this great double truth, we in Christ and Christ in us. Each epistle has its particular object and phase of truth, certainly, but they are one and all for the church, the one body. And I thought that's very interesting. A mid-Acts dispensationalist couldn't have said it any better. Just like C.I. Schofield, also being an Acts dispensationalist, said in Ephesians 3, verse 6 in his Bible, uh, study notes, that in Paul's epistles alone, we find the doctrine for the church. True. Again, like I said, they're a lot more Pauline, they're a lot more cognizant of where you found the distinction in Paul's ministry and before and after. So, interesting point that William Newell made in his commentary about the Spirit of Christ in this verse, in verse 9 and 10. He says, if the Spirit of Christ be in you, then you are Christ. Verse 10, if Christ be in you. See that phrase in verse 10? If Christ be in you. Well, how do you know Christ is in you? If the Spirit of Christ is in you. If you have the Spirit of God, if you are in the Spirit and not in the flesh, then Christ be in you. But let's move on to what he's teaching here in the context. He says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, what we know because of the gospel, by the time you get to Romans 8, you know the gospel already. And if you don't, you can review Romans 3 and 4, and that it's Christ dying for your sins uh, it's not your deeds and works that are law. It's Christ dying for you, not your works. And then he rose from the dead to give you justification and eternal life. And this is the bare bones of the gospel. This is what is the good news saving you from the condemnation of sin uh, that, that is a curse to us and uh, from our failed efforts and works that we can never attain salvation on our own. But what he, well, we know that. And so we know then that Christ died because of sin. Yes. Christ died because of sin. We also know that Christ resurrected to life because of righteousness, like his righteousness. So Christ died because of sin, and Christ resurrected because of his righteousness. He wasn't a sinner. He was perfect. He died a death that he didn't deserve anyway. He was God manifest in the flesh. He rose from the dead for righteousness' sake. It was unrighteous for him to have been condemned to be dead forever, like, like men, like just mere men. 
And so he died because of sin, and he resurrected to life because of righteousness. Romans 1 verse 4 talks about that in the very beginning of the epistle, that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So he rose from the dead because he was holy. That's why he did, because he had the power of life, right? And uh, so he rose from the dead, and he was declared to be the Son of God in that way. So this is what we know about Christ. But Romans 8, verse 10, isn't talking about Christ. It's talking about you. He says, if Christ be in you. So we know that Christ died because of sin. But he says, if Christ be in you, the body, meaning your body, is dead because of sin. Well, that's interesting. Because we knew we were sinners and deserving of death. But Christ already died for sin. And if Christ be in you, then your body is dead because of sin, already dead. And so we're talking about how to live and how to walk, and we have to, even though we recognize we're living in our body and our flesh, Romans 7 7 taught us that, even though we're carrying around this corpse, this mortal flesh, that that thing is dead with Christ. And so according to the mystery of Christ being in you, you're dead and you're risen with him. We've talked about this before, how that preaching that Christ died and rose from the dead is the gospel and is what saves people. And yet the mystery truth about that is that that death and resurrection is also yours now. Amen. That's something else besides just saying Christ died and rose from the dead. Thank God he paid that penalty. But to teach that now his death and resurrection are your death and resurrection, that's according to the mystery. That's something that was not known before. When Paul says that if Christ be in you, the body, meaning your body, is dead, that's the same thing as he says in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. It's the same thing. I'm crucified with Christ. Or back in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, because you are baptized into Christ by the Spirit, I might add. He says, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And so you see there, your body of sin, your body of sin was destroyed because Christ died. So his death becomes your death. The body is dead because of sin. Why is it because of sin? Because you're actually the sinner. He died for sin, because that was his purpose. It wasn't his. But now that he's in you, your body's dead. He died the death that it deserves to die. And it's your sin that it died. That your sin is the reason. So remember the condemnation of Romans 7, 25, where Paul says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, Christ died a death. And Romans 8's teaching, that death was your death. Okay, that's what that's teaching. Now, again, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time or even throughout history, you say, well, this is not news in Christianity. And it's not, because it's been around for 2,000 years. But it was news in the Scripture. You find nowhere else talking about this, that his death is your death. You find his death being the blood shed to atone for sins, but his death being your death now? Wow, that gets real personal intimate. How, how much closer can you get to Christ than him being in you? And what he did actually was seen as you doing it, right? It was your death. The sin in Romans 7 that was dwelling in you, dwelling in us, that was the cause for your body now being dead. And your body's now dead in Christ. But the Spirit is life. So in the Spirit, which you are, you can now say, Christ lives in me. If Christ be in you, your body is dead because of sin. And if Christ be in you, the Spirit of Christ that's in you, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Well, that's Christ living in me. That's Galatians 2.21, right? Galatians 2.20, which I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And if righteous come by the law, then Christ died in vain. That's what he's saying. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verse 8 says, If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ, with him. Why do you believe that? Because we've been put into Christ and Christ into us. That's the fellowship of the mystery. That's what that is. So the Spirit is the one who identifies you with Christ. Romans 8, verse 9 says that. Romans 6 taught that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 teaches that. You're baptized by one Spirit into the body. So how do I get into the body of Christ? You trust the gospel. Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead for your sins. Rose from the dead for you. And when you trust that, you can't save yourself. He did it. Then the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and puts you, identifies you positionally with Christ. And judicially, Christ's death is imputed for your sins, in Christ's resurrection, and that power is given to you, which we'll see here in a little bit why that's important. 
And so the spirit is life. That spirit that you have dwelling in you is life. That spirit that identifies you with Christ. And why is the spirit life? Because of righteousness. Now, this is where people kind of fall off the rails again. All over Romans 8, whenever people see the word righteousness, they go back to Deuteronomy and they think, oh, that's my righteousness. That's like me doing good things. You know, we've already established in the book of Romans, Romans 1 through 4. You could not do anything to deserve righteousness. You are under the category of ungodly. Right? Now, there are, there are good things that in our flesh we spit out. But you as a whole, if we're looking at everything you do, are categorized as one breaking the law and one is an ungodly person. All of us are. That's why you needed Christ to begin with. And now that you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and you have life not in your flesh, but because of the Holy Spirit, because of Christ, because of righteousness. The righteousness here is imputed by faith, right? It wasn't because of your fleshly deeds that you earned righteousness. It was the Holy Spirit that because he was sent by God to dwell in you that believed, righteousness of Christ was imputed to you. The Spirit is life because of righteousness of Christ given to you. That's where your life comes from. That's where your righteousness comes from. Without the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, you don't get righteousness. You don't get life. You get condemnation in yourself because you can't be any better now than you could before. Because of the Holy Spirit, that's where you're looking for righteousness. Spirit is life. Romans 5 1 says, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And it's not a coincidence that after Paul says that in Romans 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, justified by faith, no works attached there. That in that same context in verse 5, he says, hope makes not ashamed, the hope of glory we have in Christ Jesus, makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. You see, Paul already taught three chapters ago that if you're justified by faith, you have the Holy Ghost. If you're declared righteous, it's not your own, it's Christ's righteousness, and that was declared upon you because the Holy Spirit was given to you to seal and identify you as a member of Christ's body. It gives a whole new meaning then to the whole, the whole idea of being a member of the body of Christ. Because now, being a member of the body of Christ isn't just a metaphorical title, it's something that you now are because he died in his body, and now your body is dead. Because of his death. You are the body of Christ. Your arms are his arms. Your body is his, which means he died and you're dead. Which means he's alive, you're alive. You have his spirit. His spirit works with your spirit, as we'll see a little bit later in Romans 8. That's an amazing thing that the covenant could even provide for people. In Israel's uh, past, Romans 8 verse 4. Paul earlier in the chapter said that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remember that? We covered that and how people want to go there and say, well, oh, that's Deuteronomy. That's you doing good works. The righteousness of the law, not the works of the law, the righteousness of the law, which could not be given to you by you doing good works. That was established back in Romans 3. Because you come short of the glory of God. This is those who walk after the Spirit that get the righteousness of the law fulfilled in them because that righteousness was imputed to you. It was freely given to you. In fact, look at Romans 5, verse 21. This whole teaching from Romans 5, 6, 7, 8 goes back to Romans 5, where at the end of that chapter, Paul says, As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. Grace reigning over sin, abounding over sin, that grace reigns. The, the, the thing that reigns today, we talk about Christ being on the throne and things like that, and they're really they're mixing up what's reigning today. He's not sitting on the throne judging as a judge, as a king would do in a kingdom. He's not doing that today. But what is happening is Christ's grace is reigning which means that he's looking at a world of ungodly sinners saying, you can be saved because my grace abounds over every sin that you all are committing, right? And he says, grace reigns, but how does it reign? Through righteousness. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. Grace is what God in Christ did for you that you couldn't do. How does it reign through righteousness? Because it's not your righteousness. Amen. It's his. So grace can reign because the righteousness of Christ is offered to you freely by faith. That's how grace reigns. So when any system says, well, wait a minute, you got to do some good works. Nope, grace reigns higher than that because it's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. Grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life, not just temporary, longer life. Remember back in the law? If you obey your, your parents, you honor your father or mother, then you'll live a longer life. It was the first commandment with promise, if you six says. This is eternal life, folks. It's his righteousness. Eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. That's the gospel of the grace of God. And Romans 8 is telling you how to live in that grace, how to walk in that grace, which is by the Holy Spirit who's been given to you, who dwells in you, making you Christ's. And so in Romans 8, verse, verse 10, if Christ be in you, the Spirit is life because of righteousness that way. Romans 3, 24 says righteousness is freely given to you. You're justified freely by his grace. Romans 6, 23 says the gift of God, it's a gift, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 8, verse 10 says, if Christ be in you, the Spirit is life. Not your body, not flesh, not your deeds. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. Which is why there's no condemnation if you walk after the Spirit. Right, not after the flesh. If you're trying to, as a saved person whose spirit is alive, with the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, continue trying to walk after your flesh to prove yourself in your flesh, ain't going to happen. But if you walk after the knowledge of what the Holy Spirit has revealed about who you are in Christ, then you realize that sin dwells in you, but you now also realize the Holy Spirit dwells in you too. Amen. And so you get to choose who you identify yourself with. Now, God's identified you with Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse, verse 10. Let's go on to verse 11 here, where Paul talks about the Spirit dwelling in you. He says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. You see, the whole problem in Romans 7, we'll keep going back there, is that Paul knew that when he looked at himself, he looked at himself, and there was no good thing in him. Okay, there was no good thing in him. Look at Romans 7, verse 17. Let's go back and remind ourselves. It's been about a month or so. Romans 7, 17. He talks to them who know the law. And he, in Romans 7, he's, he knows justification by faith, and he knows that Christ died for his sins, and he's at peace with God. And then he tries to serve God. According to Romans 6, he's a servant of God now. That's what the title he's been given. That's the position he has. And so he's trying to serve God with that sincere heart of wanting to serve God. And then he finds out in trying to serve God, he can't. And trying to serve God, he falls on his face. And he determines there's a problem here. The problem is in me. <laughs> it's not the law. He tries to walk after the law, you know, the, the, in, the, in this, this thought experiment in Romans 7. And he says, the law says this is good. The law is perfect. The law is holy, just, and good. I just can't do it. Like, give me a list of rules. And I'll say, yep, that's good. And you try to walk and you fall on your face. It's like telling a fish to walk on ground. It's like you're not, you don't have the legs to do so. Even if you want to, you don't have the legs to do so. They'll flop around. You'll get a little bit down the road, but not very far. Romans 7, verse 17 says, Now that it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Remember that reality check? You're a Christian. You're saved by God's grace. You're justified by faith. And you have to understand that sin still dwells in you. It's paid for by Christ. You're at peace with God. And yet here you are living until glory with sin still present. Christ died for the penalty for your sins and to deliver you from the power of sins, but you are still in the presence of sins until glory, until he returns and, and takes you home, right? In Romans 7, 17, Paul says, this is the reality here, that uh, sin dwells in me. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there's the flesh, right? In my flesh dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. He cannot perform because his flesh has no power to do so. Even if he wants to, his spirit's alive, folks. He wants to. In his mind, he says later, my mind, I serve in my inner man. I serve the law of God. I want to do good. But what prevents him? This, met, this vessel that he's in, sin dwelling in him. He wants it, but he can't perform it. What's Romans 8 answer? It's not try harder, keep believing more. It's you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. You have an external source of power that's outside of you that God has given you that will help you walk after the Spirit. Now, he's not going to miraculously change your flesh. Sin still dwells in you. But something else dwells in you, according to Romans 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, don't we already establish that that's a reality for all saved people? They have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them? So you hold these twin truths. Sin dwells in me. No good thing dwells in me. Romans 7, 20 says, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Sin is dwelling in me. And if you stay looking at that, you say, ah, I'm just terrible, wretched man that I am. Sin's dwelling in me. I'm just a terrible servant. Sin dwells in me. And that's where he ends up, Romans 7, 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. 
Who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh where sin dwells? Well, ultimately, you're going to put off mortality and put on immortality. Amen. But till then, you have the Holy Spirit now. Romans 8 teaches you this. He says, if you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's not that Christ left into heaven and he left you here just to hope for something. He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. Yeah. That teaches you something about how to live now before glory. So this is good news, folks. This Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. This, by the way, you can contrast dispensationally to how the Holy Spirit worked before, right, where he came on people. Prophets of God in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon them and who caused them to say things or do miracles and things like that. It would only be some people. It would only be for a certain time. And if they did something wrong, the Holy Spirit could leave them. But now, you in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You saw last week that you can even grieve the Holy Spirit. But he's your seal. He identifies you with Christ. So sin dwells in you, and you dwells no good thing, but now the Spirit of God dwells in you. And that is your body, folks. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know you not you're the temple of God, that the Holy Ghost dwells in you. In 1 Corinthians 6, there's an added word in 1 Corinthians 6 to this. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So chapter 3.16 says, Know you not you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You go, Oh, yeah, he dwells in me. Chapter 6 says, your body. Like, it's not some mystical thing. It's spiritual for sure, but the body that he was lamenting, the body of this death where sin dwells, verse 26, 9 says, no, you're not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? Well, how can the Holy Spirit dwell in this disgusting, sin-filled body? Grace. This is the answer to that. Because a Christ is the answer to that. Because he died for your sins. That old man is dead. And so you have a choice to walk after the leading of your body or the leading of the Holy Spirit who also dwells in you. Now, the verse in Romans 8, verse 11 began with, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus. Do you see the Godhead there, all three persons? You have the Holy Spirit of, of who? Well, it's not Jesus, because it says who raised up Jesus. Of the Holy Spirit of God who raised Jesus, there's three going on there. You see that? Holy Spirit of God, the Father of God who raised up Jesus. Again, you have the three instances there. But it's the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Look at 1 Peter 3.18. If you answered God raised Jesus from the dead, you are correct. But if you answer, well, Jesus raised himself from the dead, you'd also be correct. And if you said, well, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead, you would also be correct. If you said, well, God the Father raised him from the dead, you would also be correct. Because there are verses in the Bible that say all of those things. And again, the, the lesson I saw about the Trinity, but this is how we get to the doctrine of the Trinity, is these verses in the Bible that put them all together as God. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. Now, Peter is not teaching the same thing Paul is. You have to recognize the difference here. Peter is talking about Christ, not members of his body. He's talking about Christ. 1 Peter 3, 18. He says, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death. Now, who's being put to death here? Christ is being put to death. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus was put to death in the flesh, and Jesus was quickened, made alive again, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's a verse, including Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that says it was the Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. It was the Spirit of him that raised him up from the dead. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead in that verse? God the Father. Well, 1 Peter 3.18 says the Spirit quickened him, the Holy Spirit. Look at John 2.19. So you may know John 2 from heart. In John 2.19, Jesus answers to those around him who said, What signs showest thou unto us? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days, who raises the temple of his body up? He says, I will raise it up. Right? John chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus says it again here. Verse 17, he says, Therefore doth my Father love me. There's the Father. 
and there's the son, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Man, he is, I, 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 Jesus is so self-centered. <laughs> he's God. That's what he's saying. He's got the power of God. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment I received from my father. His father's obviously God. He's the son of God. He's saying, I'm also God. That's why John 5 says, honor me as you honor the father. What? That's why Colossians 2 says he's the fullness, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why 1 Timothy 3.16 says God was manifest in the flesh. And so who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, God is the answer. <laughs> but Romans 8 is one of those places where it mentions specifically the Holy Spirit raising him from the dead because the context in Romans 8 is talking about the, the same Holy Spirit that dwells in you. That's why he mentions the Spirit raising him from the dead there. Because the Father, he's the one that purposes. He's the one. He's out there. He's God the Father. He's up there. right? And then the, Where's Jesus at? Well, he's up there too. With, he went back to the Father. Where's the Holy Spirit? In you. Amen. And yet the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus up from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in your mortal bodies. Okay, what an amazing thing to think about. Now, don't read this verse as some people have preached it and saying, well, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you better act better because think about that. The Holy Spirit's in you and he's seen everything you do, which he is. That's Ephesians 4.30. You can grieve the Holy Spirit and you should think about that. But that's, Paul's not trying to bring condemnation on you in Romans 8. He's simply pointing out the Spirit dwells in you, and the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So if you think, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Um, you have the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwelling in you. Amen. That's how you get delivered from the body of this death. You see? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This passage is the one that Nan asked about on, on Sunday. Good passage for a lesson to teach. Second Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 21. It says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us, who establishes you with Christ and who anoints you? God. What's verse 20, 22 say? Who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You see, it's the Spirit who's anointed you, who's made you consecrated, sanctified, separated to the special purpose that God ordained for you in Christ. He's the one that establishes you. Now that him, there's a power to establish us according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Remember Romans 16, 25? Well, how do you get established? You say, well, God establishes me. Yeah, but you know, God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that dwells in you, is the one that's going to help you understand the things of God, is going to give you the knowledge of the things of God. It's the Holy Spirit there. Romans 8, because Paul talks so much about the Spirit, is the closest you'll hear me sound Pentecostal because I talk so much about the Spirit, but so does Paul, <laughs> right? He talks about the Holy Spirit and what his functions and what he's doing in you. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps you. Look at 2 Timothy 1.14. 2 Verse 13, Paul says, and this is important, folks, every time Paul talks about the Holy Spirit and his function, it's always in the context talking about knowing and understanding the things of God. Even in Romans 8, he's talking about the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and the power you get from his resurrection and all this. But remember last week, he talked about the things of the Spirit and you knowing the things of the Spirit. 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. There's the words, the form of sound words thou hast heard of me. And faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by, what was committed unto him? Form of sound words. The form of sound words was committed to Timothy. And he says, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. So the Holy Ghost apparently helps you keep the form of sound words. We'll learn more about that in 1 Corinthians 2 and later in Romans 8. But the Holy Ghost has a function and a ministry that he's performing in you. And that is he keeps you in Christ. He seals you in Christ. He establishes you in Christ. He sanctifies you in Christ. And he quickens you in Christ. That's what he does. The Holy Ghost is the one that applies all the things that Christ accomplished and performed in you. That's what he's doing. And he's bringing this up because we're talking about what's dwelling in our body and our flesh. And it can get kind of lonely because we're thinking, well, Jesus is way up there and he won't come back for a while. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. And he is working. God is dwelling in you. Okay. 
And so this Holy Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, and by the way, that raising of Christ from the dead was literal, was physical. Yeah. It was from Christ's mortal flesh. You know, Christ had mortal flesh. He didn't have sinful flesh, but he had mortal flesh. Like, his flesh could die, right? No sin. But Christ had mortal flesh. And the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ up from the dead, was literal, physical, from his mortal flesh unto glory. And here you are. So Christ died for sin, and you, here you are. There's sin dwelling in you. You have a body that's going to die because of sin. And needs the power to raise from the dead. You have the Spirit of Christ in you. So you will literally and physically, in your mortal flesh, have literal glory, just like Christ does. Amen. You see how you follow the pattern of Christ because you have the same Spirit doing the same thing in you that he did with Christ in his mortal flesh? He says, he shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Now, of course, this initially and primarily is talking about your heavenly glory here. Later in Romans 8, in verse 18, he says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The Holy Spirit will give us glorified bodies. Romans 8, verse 23, he says, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Right? So the Holy Spirit is the one that promises, he's the, the ticket stub, your glorified body. And he's that assurance in you. In 2 Corinthians 5, it's the same thing. Paul talks about putting off this clothing of mortality and putting on immortality. Remember all that? Be absent from the body and present with the Lord and vice versa. Well, this is the glory that we have because of the Spirit working in us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse uh, 4 and 5. We that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. That's Romans 7. O body of this death. <laughs> We do groan, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon. We want a new glorified body, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that wrought, that hath wrought us for the, us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You see that? Every time Paul talks about here, you getting glory, he mentions the Spirit here, because that's the Spirit's job, right? Christ rose from the dead. He's in heaven. He accomplished he said it is finished. He did his task, right? And how do you get in Christ? You trust the gospel. The Holy Spirit puts you there. How do you get grace from the dead? The Holy Spirit does that. How do you get glorified? The Holy Spirit changes you into the image of Christ from glory to glory. That's how that works. You see, Christ did what he did. And praise God, he's our head, but our head's up there. And the Holy Spirit is what unites us all in his body. Okay? So Paul's given this to us as good news here, as this, this way of thinking about the way we walk. So the quickening of your mortal bodies is primarily talking about heavenly glory, but it's also to be used, as we'll see later in the chapter here, to be used for your service now. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians 6. Now, there's no promise that your mortal body will magically change to immortal now. You have to wait for glorification for that. But you see the 1 Corinthians 6.13, for example, where Paul says to the Corinthians, who were, to say the least, struggling to walk, after the spirit in their mortal flesh. He says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. The Corinthians thought, well, if I have a mortal flesh here that wants to sin, why not feed it? I'm saved anyway. And Paul says, look, God's going to destroy your mortal flesh. Okay, he says, now the body that you have, your mortal flesh, is not for fornication. God did not purchase your body for fornication, he says, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. It's in this chapter. Later on, he says in verse 20, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So this is teaching against the idea that my body is just a worthless thing that I'm not even going to try to serve God in it. I'm not even going to learn how to walk into the Spirit. The Spirit has no effect on this mortal flesh. No, Paul says if you've got the Holy Spirit of God, if you are Christ, then that body is his and the Holy Spirit dwells in it. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit your body is. Right? And so that does have an effect on whether or not you consider the choices you make uh, uh, being the temple of God and, and the Holy Spirit. So there's that. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, look what Paul says here. You can let sin reign in your mortal flesh, folks. You can let sin happen. You can be saved by grace and let sin reign in you. Paul says, let not sin reign in your mortal body, in your members. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, don't let it be. Resist it. Struggle it. We dealt with that back in Romans 7, remember? The, the, the instruction is for you to resist the leading of your flesh and follow the leading of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, Paul says, I keep under my body, 
What? I bring it un into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. See what Paul's doing there? He is whipping his body into use. But where does he get the power to do this? Paul wasn't perfect. He wasn't sinless. He hadn't attained perfection. He hadn't been resurrected yet in the glory. But he's bringing his body into subjection. How? Because his spirit was being strengthened by what the Holy Spirit was providing such that he can take his body, flesh, and bring it into subjection to minister what 1 Corinthians 9 said he was ministering. That's how that operates. So if you're struggling with your flesh, you say, how do I get the strength in my flesh? You need what the Holy Spirit's dishing out because you can't dig down deep in yourself and get it. You have to get it from here. Well, how do I get that? Do I, do I get the anointing oil out or something? I'm going to draw the picture up here to complete the image. You get that, folks. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, but your mirror, your telescope, your microscope unto what the Holy Spirit's doing is the Bible. Amen. This book are the words of the Holy Spirit of God that tells you what he's doing and what he does and who you are and everything else. So how do you strengthen this? By the Holy Spirit dwells in you. How do you learn about that? You get this thing in you, right? It strengthens your inner man so that you might bring your body into subjection is what Paul says. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul prays. He prays that your whole soul and spirit and body be preserved blameless. Remember that? Until the coming of the Lord? Now, your body, your flesh, your mortal, corrupted flesh is going to drop dead into dust and ash, and it'll be glorified into a new body. Amen. What's he mean, your body preserved blameless? He's making the point that, look, God purchased you. Your soul has been saved. Your spirit's been quickened. And this is the temple now until glory of the Holy Ghost. And so the orientation should be by the Thessalonians that I'm going to use this for the glory of God. And thus, that's the effort. Paul knows that he's not going to be able to change his flesh. But by the power of the Holy Ghost, God's word working in him, he can strengthen his inner man so that it would, he can use that flesh. He says, what's he saying, Philippians 1? He knows that he can magnify Christ with his body. How? He says, well, whether I live or die, right? It's going to be uh, in the service of Christ is what he says. And so he's using his body for that. In 1 Thessalonians 4, remember the, the will of God? In 1 Thessalonians 4, it concerns your body. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, the will of God in 1 Timothy 2 was all men be saved, come to knowledge of the truth, in everything give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that. Chapter 4 says, he says, your sanctification is will of God. Sanctification. You being set apart and anointed as God's member, minister, saint. Well, who does that? The Holy Spirit does that, right? And so the will of God is your sanctification. You're sanctified in Christ, folks, Amen. freely. Like, in Christ, he set you apart. But, like, working that out, <laughs> you being set apart in your walk is different than you positionally being set apart by Christ and his grace. Because you can look and act just like everybody else with no discernible difference. Every word out of your mouth has no truth to it. You don't walk with any knowledge or acknowledgement of the truth working in you. None of it. And thus, you, in that point, can't tell whether you're saved or not. Right? Because it's God's grace that saves. But I hope that you could tell a little bit or guess if someone's going around preaching the gospel of the grace of God over and over and over again. You have a pretty good idea what's coming out of their heart. Right? But that can only happen because of God's word, the Holy Spirit working in them. And so if you want to get more study about this idea in Romans 8, verse 11, this, this is the great mystery of godliness in Romans 8, folks. You know what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3? He says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justifying the Spirit. This is Jesus Christ. Right? Why is he called the mystery of godliness? Because godliness, the way you walk, the way you serve, the way the bishops and the deacons and elders in 1 Timothy 3 were supposed to walk and behave was in Christ, in the Spirit, according to the revelation of the mystery, right? With their mortal bodies quickened. R read the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3. It's like it's impossible for anyone to keep all those things. But that was the mystery of godliness. It's not a law there. It's in Christ, in the Spirit, according to the mystery. That's why the mystery was God manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, preached in the Gentiles, received in the glory, right? You walk by his Spirit dwelling in you. A lot of people don't know how to walk, for sure. They know how to walk after the law and after the flesh. They know how to walk after religion, but they don't know how to walk after the Spirit. 
That's a harder thing to learn, but the scripture teaches us that. And look at Romans 8, verse 12. Moving on here, Romans 8, 12 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Therefore, why is that there for? Because of the things that the Spirit does dwelling in you. Because of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and all the things he's doing dwelling in you, keeping you, sanctifying you, sealing you. Because of that, he says, we are debtors. Now, he goes on to say not to the flesh, but debtors. What does that word debtor mean? It's, on the surface, it's pretty, pretty simple to understand there. It's a person who owes another person, right? You're indebted to them. Uh, you're under obligation to do something in repayment, right? Well, what's he mean that you're debtors? Well, to the Spirit, to Christ, because look at everything the Holy Spirit does for you, right? If you don't know that Christ and the Spirit has given you so many free things and so many things in you, then you, you have to go back and study that first. When you see all the riches of God's grace that he's given to you, then you realize, wow, I got a lot of things that I didn't deserve. What The proper response there is gratitude, like thank you, right? And a sense of indebtedness, which is what gratitude is. Gratitude is the sense of, that's more than what I could pay. Or, I, I, didn't, I, you know, I, didn't, I don't deserve this. And you, you try to pay back that debt with just a thank you. Right, to let the person know that you're not ungrateful, that you don't think, oh, I'm entitled and I deserve that. Because that's the opposite of gratefulness is you think you just deserve it, which is everywhere in society. That's why thankfulness and gratitude is less and less. People complain a lot. And why do they complain? Because they think they deserve everything. And so when they don't get it, they complain. When they do get it, there's no thank you whatsoever. It's just what I deserve. But if you realize you don't deserve it and what you get is grace, then what is a response is indebtedness and gratitude. Amen. Okay. So we're, we're debtors is what Paul says. But we're not debtors to the flesh. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you and because the Holy Spirit is what puts you into Christ and seals you and keeps you and sanctifies you and does these things in you, then you owe nothing to this flesh right here. Amen. You ain't nothing to this. This thing, which was the body that gave you life, right, for so long before you were saved in Christ, you're supposed to know now that life is found over here. Amen. That's where you get it. There is no life here. Which It takes some faith to, to acknowledge that, folks, because everyone else is living their lives here. Mm -hmm. You're living your life here, unless you acknowledge this. So he says, we're not debtors. Therefore, because the Holy Spirit dwells in you, because he's going to raise you with Christ, because you have life in him, but because he, you're not in debt to the flesh. There's nothing you owe it. Romans 7, when the person says, oh, wretched man I am, the things I want to do I can't do, and there's a law in my members that brings me captive to the law of sin and death, this person is indebted to their flesh. They're bound to it. I have to do it. Right? That's what that is. Not anymore. The Holy Spirit set you free from this. You don't have to. Your flesh is here. But this is where you live, right? And that's what Paul's trying to teach us. It's a change of our mind, okay? And so we're not debtors to the flesh. You owe the flesh nothing to live after it. You ever heard the, the phrase, you owe it to yourself? You ever heard this? You owe it to yourself? What does that mean, you owe it to yourself? What exactly do you deserve? Right? That's what the, say, Frank, say, the phrase is saying. It's saying that you deserve something, and therefore you owe it to yourself to do this, to say this, to get this, to go this, whatever it is. But what if you have the mind of thinking, I don't deserve anything, an old wretched man that I am, and yet the Holy Spirit dwells in me and I have everything because of that? Yeah. Well, then who are you exactly? Are you this or are you in Christ? You do not have an indebtedness to your flesh, to who you are in the old man. You don't owe yourself anything. The, 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 the term, you only live once. Okay. Well, why is that used for? It's used for doing something now because I only live once and I got to get this done in my life or I'm going to get old, I can't do it, I'm going to die. Like, what does that not have faith in? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. That, like, the life you have is eternal. So, yeah, but I go to heaven, I won't be able to go see that Grand Canyon, you know. What are you talking about? 
the glory of the same God who made the glories of this earth will promise you heavenly glory that abounds over anything you see here. And you think you owe it to yourself and that you only have one life to live. So you're indebted to your fleshly body now, the limited time it has to live to do things to please it. Where'd you get that? But we all think like that, don't we? It's like, well, I've got so much time here on earth. But what if you, you got rid of that? What if you said, I don't owe you nothing? then maybe you'd fill your time with thinking of how then can I serve in the Spirit? Amen. How then can I do that? And it will then change your orientation of what you think you owe. You don't owe that, you owe this. You owe God, right? Now, people who don't appreciate this doctrine, who are not saved, they go, what? you're wasting your life going to church, studying that dusty book, serving a God you don't even know exists, you know? They're wasting it. Look at the life you could live if you didn't do all that. No, 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 no. You're all going to die. I was too. Death is coming for everyone. Life is in the Spirit. You don't know life unless you know life in the Holy Spirit. You don't know life. Hmm. Ever heard of the phrase, suck the marrow out of life? You know who said that? Hank Thoreau. David Henry Thoreau. Changed his name to Henry David Thoreau, Right? He didn't have a house, so he stayed with his friend, lived out in his backyard in a cottage, wrote about the plants that he saw. He says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, to, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. What, who had to teach? The woods. Walden Pond. To see what it had to teach. Right? And not when I came to die, to discover that I had not lived. Too late. He didn't know the Holy Ghost. Right. Okay? And this is a common thing. Thoreau and transcendentalism and romanticism, this permeates culture without God. He wasn't a Christian. Okay? And he says, I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Life is so precious. That's true. Everyone should know that. Even unbelievers should know life is precious to them, which is why they should seek eternal life from God. The one that give it. He says, life is so precious, life is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation. Like, I only have this short life, I'm going to die anyway. So he didn't want to do that. He wanted to, I wanted to live deep, is what he says, and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life. You can do that when you don't have a job. <laughs> he didn't. Right? Like I said, he stayed with his friend in his backyard for two years building a house. You see that 50 times on YouTube a day. You know those guys that go out in the woods and build houses? That's what he did. What else? And he wrote about it. And because of that, it's the same impression people have today. They watch the YouTube video, look at that guy building a log cabin in the woods. It's amazing. He's really sucking the tree mirror out of life, you know. That's all he did, too. He did it before YouTube. So this was the first viral YouTube log cabin video. You know, that's what this is. That's what Walden Pond is. You know, he didn't, he didn't actually say too much that was novel. You get a few catchy phrases here, right, that really don't speak to knowing life at all. But they do to someone who's dead in their flesh. Because there's got to be something more than what my flesh is going to do, than the routine of life to work and provide for family and have children and to actually achieve something or maybe seek higher things than our own emotions and feelings and nature. He, he wanted to learn from nature. What about the God of nature? Oh, there's no God of nature. Serving the creature more than the creator, Romans 1, right? So this is, this is his heir. And so he, he went out to the backwoods and he built his own house and didn't have tools, didn't try to use modern machines, anything like that. When the townspeople came to help him, he got upset. <laughs> You're ruining my seeking life. Good luck with that, man. Right? Life is found in Christ, Amen. found the Holy Spirit. He says he wanted to cut a broad swath and shave close to drive life into a corner, reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why, then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and to be able to give a true account of it. Um, seeking the truth in a pond and trees isn't where you look, see for it. Right? It's in God's word. Amen. But suck the marrow out of life, that's what he's looking for, so many other people are looking for. He owed it to himself. How many lives did he have to live? He died at, what, 44, I think. Right? Died at 44. Uh, many people died younger back then. His brother died at 42. Right? His other sibling died at 27. And so life was short, shorter than now. 
And uh, that you see ideas have consequences. And when you teach ideas about the Enlightenment, that we need to question these religious texts in the Bible and God and his existence, and he's not doing anything. Can you see he's not doing anything? Yeah, God's not doing things he was doing with Moses and David. He's offering grace to a dying world and giving his Holy Spirit that people may walk by faith and spiritual truths that are revealed in the most important book in human history. Right? More important than Walden Pond was his essays on civil disobedience, but even then, aren't influenced by much truth at all. When he died, his aunt asked him, who was religious, have you found your peace with God? And he said, I didn't know we had a quarrel. That's a lost person, right? That's what that is. Not knowing the things of the spirit, walking in his flesh. We're not indebted to the flesh, folks. The point is that what he was doing, it was the inspiration for so many that came after him, not in his life, by the way, because he was very uninspirational in his life. He was mocked and ridiculed. It was actually afterward where publishers kind of glorified what he did, that people started following his idea of living, which was to go pursue the wilderness, right? And by doing that, they were departing from what we had learned from God, right? We're not indebted to the flesh to go seek to please and sat- to fulfill your, you're not, you're not indebted to fulfill your bucket list. No. You don't have to. Like, people think that they need to have that because I I owe it to humanity to try to live life to the fullest. Then get saved in Christ Jesus and have eternal life. Amen. That is not a waste of life. That's actually the only way to have life. A waste of life is not being in Christ and dwindling down to nothing. That's a waste of life. Okay. Neither do you owe anything to religion. Whether it be the pursuits of your flesh or sinful flesh and its desires or religion, you owe nothing to that either. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. You, you owe nothing to religion. You say, well, you're, you're saying I should become a monk and an ascetic and, and just, you know, pray to God 24 hours a day. And No, that, that's religious stuff. That's without knowledge of the truth of God and his word. It's amazing how much when you study God's word in his grace, specifically his grace, how it delivers you from all the religious creations of humanity, even the religious creations that use the name of Jesus. They use it wrongly. And Galatians 6 is an example of this. He says, as many as desire. Now, Paul here says in verse 11, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. He's serious about the Galatians and their problem. The Galatians didn't have the Corinthian problem. They weren't trying to seek the own pursuits of their flesh. They were trying to do religion. They thought now that they had Christ, that they could do the law where everyone else failed, right? So they'll keep that law to get more spiritual blessing and more spiritual marrow out of life, right? He says, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. What did he say there? He said, they they want you to be circumcised. They want you to do these religious things so they don't face persecution for the cross of Christ. Why would you be persecuted for the cross of Christ? Because the cross of Christ says, you don't need to be circumcised. The cross of Christ says, Ten Commandments, what? You couldn't keep them anyway. Christ did. The cross of Christ says you get justified freely. That's what the cross of Christ says. As soon as you say freely to any religious system, they go berserk. Well, if you do that, the whole church is going to explode. We can't get money to turn the lights on. We can't have this amazing sanctuary. We can't pay the pastor. We can't. Well, sorry, that's how it works. The cross of Christ is where glory is at. That's where life is at. Verse 13, look what he says. The secret about religious people. He says, for neither they themselves who are circumcised, keep the law. Even those who are in religions, they don't keep the law anyway. And they're trying to get you to do it. But they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. They may count you among them, you know. Look, we have another guy doing what we do. He was baptized into the fold. He was circumcised. He's he's another tither. He's an elder again, you know. What do you have to do to prove yourself to people, whereas the Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. And you're accepted in Jesus Christ. He says the next verse, not coincidentally, God forbid that I should glory. Well, people glory in religion, folks. He says, God forbid I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world's crucified unto me and I unto the world. You can only say that according to the mystery if you're in Christ and Christ is in you. And so you don't owe anything to religion. Jesus died for all, all to him you owe. The life you live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God. Your life is Christ. To live for you now is not to live for whatever you want. It's to live 
for Christ. And that is above all things. Psalms 5, 14 and 15 says that the love of Christ constrains us. If he died for all, then we're all dead. And those that live should live for him who died for them. That's what verse 15 says. Not for the flesh, not for you, not for yourself, or not for religion, but for him. Romans 8, 13 then goes on to say, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For if ye, for if ye, so we're going back now to the conditions, right? If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you live after the Spirit, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. This is a life and death issue. Yeah. Interesting. Conditioned on what? Whether you live after the flesh or whether you mortify the deeds of the body. This is, sounds a lot like Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation to you and in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. Or Romans 8, verse 4, which says, The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in you who walk not after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Interesting. You're not your own, folks. The flesh and its life that's worth living in the flesh leads to sin, selfishness, and death. Vanity. That's what it leads to. So how do I deal with that then? Well, how else am I supposed to live? Romans 8 verse 13 says, through the Spirit. Amen. Well, again, this is the question people all constantly have. What is that spiritual walk? It's by the knowledge, the instruction that the Holy Spirit gives us in his word. Right? Not simply the laws. That's not the laws. It's talking about who you are in Christ, what Christ has done for you, how to change your mind. What God wants, what the Spirit is trying to lead you to, to have is a changed mind about who you are and what Christ has done for you. And with that changed mind, informed by right doctrine, that is how you walk. So where do I walk? In Christ, informed with right doctrine. That's called the mind of Christ is what that is. You could do anything with that for God. <laughs> you can't do anything your flesh wants with that. And he says through the Spirit. He says if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. See that through the Spirit part? That is necessary. He doesn't say if you live after the flesh you shall die, but if you mortify the deeds of the body you shall live. That's not the verse. He says, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. Without the Spirit, this is verse is irrelevant. Yeah. He's not telling you, mortify the deeds of the body and you'll live. If that were true, then you can have life simply by stopping sinning. That's easy enough, right? No. <laughs> he says, through the Spirit. That's necessary. If you don't recognize the through the Spirit part of that verse, then you're going back to Romans 7. Oh, wretched man that I am, the things I want to do, I can't do. What's it mean to mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit? Galatians talks a lot about this. We were just there a moment ago. Galatians 5 and 6 talks about walking at the Spirit, just like Romans 8 does. And he says in Galatians 6, verse 8, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. How do you sow to the flesh? Well, you know how to do that. You've been doing it your whole life. What it wants, you do. Right? You serve. You subject yourself to. How do you sow after the Spirit? The Holy Spirit, that is. Right? You hear the Spirit's words. You read them. You seek spiritual understanding. Right? You learn the will of God. That's how you sow to the Spirit. If you do that, you reap life everlasting with salvation, but also with your life before glory. Don't make this verse about your salvation or justification. It doesn't depend on your deeds, okay? That doesn't depend on your deeds. And this verse says, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body. That's when you shall live. You'll have no condemnation. The righteousness of God will be fulfilled in you. And that's why he says in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And we'll cover half this verse next week, but I just want to deal real quick here with this led by the Spirit, which we'll pick up again next week. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, let the Spirit. Follow the Spirit's leading. The Spirit is leading me to say this to you. You hear so many Christian phrases that people use about the leading of the Holy Ghost. I went to bed last night, then I woke up, and the Spirit was leading me to the refrigerator. And I pulled it out, and I ate it. You know, like, That's how meaningless some of the things that people say are. How do you know the Holy Spirit told you to move over there, take that job, marry that person, you know, buy those groceries, buy that car? What it is? How do you know that? How do you know? I just know. That's not good enough. That's intuition. That's within yourself. That's probably your flesh telling you something. Yeah. Right? 
How do you know the Holy Spirit is telling you anything? Answer, the Word of God. Amen. That's how you know. So how do you know the Holy Spirit is leading you? You read the Word of God. What's it mean to be led of the Spirit? It's definitely not following your feelings or your desires or your flesh or your dreams. That's not being led of the Spirit. That's being led of yourself and calling it the Spirit. Being led of the Spirit is knowing where the Spirit wants you to go. What does the Spirit want? Well, we saw already the Spirit is the Spirit of God. He testifies the things of Christ. What does God want? What's God's will? Can we know that from the Bible that divided? But yes, you can. So if you know God's will, he says, this is what I will for you. This is my will. It's just stated in the scripture in black and white. Then you know what God is leading you. What the Holy Spirit's leading you. You know that. You can know that. And all that remains is your choice. Whether or not you're going to follow what the Spirit has said to lead you in understanding and walk, or else you're going to follow another leading. The leading of your flesh, the leading of the world, the leading of the course of this world, as Ephesians 2 says, which we're still living under, folks. You're in Christ, but he says you were following the course of this world. Well, that's true. Every other believer does, does that. But now that you're saved, you can still do that. It's just wrong. <laughs> because you have something else that's leading you somewhere else. And you also know what that is if you study the Word of God rightly divided. And so now you have two things pulling you in two different directions. And it's your choice saying, I'm going to follow after that, or I'm going to follow after that. So if you be led of the Spirit... Everyone who is saved and knows who they are in Christ is led after the Spirit. Every one of us. And we're led with the same thing. Amen. Right. It's just a matter of whether we're going to listen or we're going to heed his lead. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. That's what the Spirit is leading you to know. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, by the Spirit of God, we know the things of God. That's what the Spirit is leading you to know, the free things you freely have of God. Romans 8, the last four verses tonight, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and what he's done for you and what he's going to do for you in glory. That's what he wants you to know. That's what he's leading you to know. And you can reject that and ignore it and neglect it, and you're rejecting the Spirit's leading. So the Spirit instructs us through his word, through the word of God, we choose to hold the course or not. Amen. And that's where we're at. Okay? We'll deal with the difference between being led and walking next week. Um, as Paul says, if we are living in the Spirit, we should walk after the Spirit. And if you're led of the Spirit and not of the law, these are things you can know for certain. You can know the leading of the Spirit for certain, just like I can, from the Scripture. Yes. All right, any questions or any comments about the Spirit and the Spirit of Christ in you? Yeah, right.